Well, good afternoon. My name is Mark Maynard. I'm pleased to welcome you to this Washington Labs Academy event. We hope you find today's presentation useful and informative. We have developed this monthly international approval series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face when obtaining global marketplace product approvals for electronic and electrical devices. We recognize that compliance engineering and certification challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support our customers. Before we begin, I want to go over a few housekeeping details. First, I hope everyone can see the title slide on your computer. Next, we have muted everyone's uh, microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. A recording of the presentation is underway and will be sent to all attendees. A full screen view may be preferred. To select view and full screen, then you can use escape to return to normal view. We'd like to hear from you. You can see contact information uh, on the end of the presentation. And we also encourage questions during the presentation. You can submit a question by enabling the chat or Q&A icon located at the top or side of your screen and typing your question to the host. We'll go through all the questions in the presentation as time permits. We estimate the presentation will take uh, around 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. So today's topic is non European Union, European compliance, which is kind of a mouthful. But we're talking about the countries that aren't members of the European Union. There's uh, quite a few of them out there, and some are grouped in this category in different ways. I've uh, arbitrarily selected 24 of them that we're going to go over today. First about me, if you haven't attended one of these before, I'm the Training and Business Development Manager for Washington Labs Academy, and I also have another role at ACB as the International Approvals and Business Development Manager. I have over 30 years experience in compliance and RF engineering in the areas of EMC, EMI, wireless telecom, product safety, design for the environment, and quality management systems. I'm also a senior member of the IEEE. If you aren't a member, I highly recommend it. And uh, I get a lot of usefulness out of there. I'll talk about at the end. So some of the vocabulary we have today for international approvals. Uh, local representative, sometimes called just a local rep, is an in-country agent who's authorized via registered layer of authorization from the company to serve as an official for importing manufacturing companies. So this would be the case if you don't have a business presence, uh, for example, say in Ukraine, you can hire a local representative there to serve as the uh, uh, you're the face of the company that can deal with product recalls or other issues with compliance that they may need to talk to an authorized representative for. GDP PPP, this is a gross domestic product on a purchasing power parity basis, which is economic rating of countries. So, so per person, you know, what can they uh, effectively purchase? And this kind of gives you an idea of the, it's a rough guide for the market there. If you're selling consumer electronics, are they going to have um, enough uh, you know, extra spending to be able to buy your products, uh, depending on what category you're in? So that's one of the uh, non-compliance uh, things that we put in there. Make sure you're going into the right countries. Uh, a lot of companies say, well, we're going international, we're going everywhere. Well, it may not make sense for everywhere. So I'm trying to give you some uh, weighted factors that can help you with that. Also, the population, that's going to tell you how many potential consumers you've got there. Anywhere from the first with the China, close to 1.4 billion. And the Pitcairn Islands has 54 residents. So, you know, use that also with the GDP PPP to take a look at what makes the most sense for your company and your products. I do want to give credit to where I've got all the demo, uh, logistic and demographic information on the different countries. The World Factbook is courtesy of the U.S. Central Intelligence AG, and this is a public domain site. You can, uh, I'm allowed to reproduce materials there so as long as I give uh, this copyright notice and indicate it came from them. So that's the purpose of this. So uh, that's where all the information, all the country maps and flags and uh, other country-specific information came from today. So our agenda today, we're going to go uh, a little introduction. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different because this is a, a pretty wide varying uh, group. It's not uh, strictly 
easy to group together because they've got different agendas and different uh, compliance schemes. Talk about the EFTA countries, uh, the EU uh, candidate countries. Those are the countries that are trying to become EU members. Uh, and then those other countries which accept the CEU mark as proof of compliance. And then there's the EAC uh, compliance mark, comes from Eurasian Economic Union. This is a, a similar to the European Union, is uh, set up as a competitor to it by Russia and four other countries, uh, our member countries. So it's all five countries with one approval, and we'll talk about that. Also, there's independent ones that have totally unique schemes, not tied to the CE uh, a scheme of the European Union or any others. And then we'll have some conclusions and recommendations at the end. So what we're not talking about today is the EU member countries. So I've got them listed here just for reference. So these are all uh, European Union member countries. They use a CE marking uh, or a scheme to demonstrate proof of compliance on the uh, product labels and also use the uh, CE reports, whether it's those based on the radio equipment directive for anything that transmits uh, information uh, through wires or uh, telecom equipment, central office equipment. And the EMC directives, product safety directives, depending on what your uh, uh, product is, there's a uh, European Union uh, directive that covers that, uh, for whether it's medical or industrial, uh, aeronautical or uh, shipboard uh, equipment. So we've got an assortment of 24 countries. There's a, a little bit arbitrary in there. Some are uh, other people consider some of them part of the Middle East or part of the Asia. Uh, but I'm, I'm the ones that are, I think they're, they're you know, uh, border on the uh, Europe and have strong ties uh, and trading partners and or Russia uh, and that uh, general area in there where those uh, your typical European continent join together. So a wide variety of different levels of economic development. We'll talk about that for a minute. And uh, internet and Telecom infrastructure can vary widely from country to country. They're not all, uh, you know, easy to group together. So wide uh, array of political systems. Some are open democracies, others not so much, uh, with uh, uh, authoritarian regimes in place. So make sure you're going to the market the countries that make sense for your company and the products you're offering. So here's a uh, listing of the 24 countries, and as I was saying, you know, the GDP PPP is a rough measure for the, uh, you know, per person parity, so it's weighted uh, for the individual in each country. You see, we go all the way from Russia, you know, the, the number six rating on that, down to Greenland, which is 193. But you can't just look at this and say, well, that, you know, I'm going to toss out Greenland. There's only about 200 something countries in the world. They're down there at the bottom. Well, you are, if you've got CE mark, you've already got approval for Greenland. So you're going to have to look at these individually as we go through here. And I'll be talking about how Greenland's uh, able to do that. And well as the other countries. So the EFTA countries, you may have thought these were uh, EU member countries. Uh, they're not. Well, it is the European Free Trade Association. But they have strong ties to the EU. And they've uh, got trade uh, agreements in place with the EU where they can trade pretty much just as any other CE member country does. And that's Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Switzerland. Uh, you know, Norway and Switzerland are the uh, two largest countries that aren't EU member countries. You can see the GDP there is uh, 39 for Switzerland, you know, a lot of banking industry there. Number 48 for Norway, a lot of natural resources and uh, technical products come out of there. Liechtenstein. It's a 179, but it's an incredibly small country, but it has a lot of banking. Uh, Iceland, um, it's kind of isolated, but we'll talk about its ties with the EU here in a minute. So um, they've all got their trade agreements in place. Uh, Iceland, which is signed Norway, is through a trade agreement on European economic area. Switzerland has a separate one. Well, it's set up with the European Union, but the effect is the same. They can trade pretty much as just any other EU member country can. Um, so they accept all the CE reports and, and declarations, proof of compliance in those countries for importation, for selling products in country, and for marketing. You know, provide the national telecom authorities. Uh, need to make sure that your products aren't uh, interfering if you're uh, broadcasting on certain frequencies that are interfering with their 
emergency channels or anything else in those areas. And um, all, uh, all except Iceland is, uh, has uh, websites available in English. Um, Norway and Switzerland have the uh, most information on theirs. So possible future developments. Here's the information I was talking about Iceland. So uh, they had applied to be EU member country, but uh, they uh, because they they've got uh, strong ties to uh, uh, in there. They, they they've got their own uh, agreement. In fact, they decided they had what they needed. They didn't need to join the European Union. So they're accepting those CE marks. It is, you know, possible at some point, uh, you know, uh, politics uh, that are against them joining currently. You know, we got a strong independent streak there, and uh, they may decide at some future point. Right now, it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. But the net effect is nothing because they're member of the FTA, so they have free trade agreement in place with the European Union. So EU cabinet countries. So if you're familiar with the European Union, it's a path uh, you have to take. You have to meet certain and economic goals, show your economy stable, uh, your political goals, that you've got an open society. And so this can take, you know, years to achieve. Uh, there's seven countries on path that we're going to talk about uh, that have officially applied to become a member country. In Albania, Greenland, Montenegro, Republic of Macedonia, uh, Serbia, and Turkey. And so as part of that work towards doing this, they've been switching over to the regulatory systems, the EU CE mark. And so they've got agreements in place to take those. And we'll talk about a couple other countries that are still recovering from it. A lot of these are, uh, these two were former parts of the uh, Yugoslavia uh, when it broke apart in years of civil war. And so they've still got a lot of rebuilding to do. Uh, but we'll talk about that uh, in more detail in a few slides down. So first, let's look at the EU Canada countries. And so we're talking about those that formally accept the CE mark. They've got a trade agreement of place of some sorts that allows them to do this. So those uh, CE reports and uh, declaration of conformity uh, are taken as proof of compliance. Uh, their GDP PPP is ranked 125th in the world. So it might be a first tier country to go to, maybe a second or uh, definitely a third tier country you would go into. Uh, they uh, applied for membership in 2009, but they still have a way to go on their uh, economic and political goals. They also joined NATO in 2009, which helps their application to become a full EU member country. So ACAP is their uh, National Telecom Authority, and uh, the uh, uh, website is not in English, but uh, does have a... Uh, a bit of information now. There's some things are in English, uh, mainly press announcements. Uh, but Google Translate is a good source for uh, uh, rough translations. Don't rely on as official translations. Definitely not for anything technical. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's uh, you know pretty much you got you see your ports and uh, marks on the product in place, and you're you're good to go for these people. Just make sure your products aren't interfering with any of their uh, emergency channels or military channels. Uh, Greenland is ranked 193rd in the world. This is the one I was mentioning. Uh, you know, even though it's a small country, if you've got CE approval, you know, the EU approval, you've already got Denmark approval because they're a uh, territory of Greenland. And so uh, it's a kingdom, part of the kingdom of Denmark, and uh, they have automatic EU citizenship as a territory of Greenland, I mean, of uh, uh, Denmark. And uh, they had joined the EU originally, but left. But the net effect is, you know, they're they're uh, Danish citizens. Uh, they're so they've got this uh, Overseas Countries and Territories Act that the EU put into place, saying that any territory of an EU member country has the same rights and privileges for trading that a actual member country does. And so, seat reports and declarations are good for all that. They're uh, Website is Telepost, and I was just looking at it. I always uh, check these links before I give a uh, uh, presentation if I'm updating stuff. And it, uh, it's not in English, and it's got some unusual pictures on the uh, website you may want to check out. Uh, they have a, uh, a lot of indigenous influence from their uh, natives there, and you can see some of that. Not your typical uh, government webpage, I don't think. So, Montenegro. 
is, was part of that former Yugoslav Republic, and uh, you know they've been rebuilding. They're at 160 for GDP PPP. They have uh, tourism, export of refined metals, large part of the economy. They applied in 2008 uh, to become a member country. Started uh, uh, EU accession negotiations was the next step in 2012. And they allow, uh, you know, get agreements in place to accept the CE marks and reports as proof of compliance. So uh, anything that's done to an EU directive, and the most common example here is uh, low voltage directive, EMC directive. Oh, I need to update this one. It's not the RNTTE directive anymore. It's the red directive uh, that went into effect a couple of years ago. And the National Telecom Authority's ECAP, they do have an English language website, so you can get information from there. So Macedonia also has, is called the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia or just Macedonia. GDP PPP is 131st in the world. However, they have a gray market or black market, however you want to term it. It's estimated to be an additional 20 to 45 percent of GDP. So that kind of indicates that it may be a little bit wild, wild west as far as the uh, regulations compliance that goes into effect and, uh, and how it's monitored and uh, policed there. So that's something else to take into consideration if you're considering going into this country, that how you're going to deal with that, uh, those issues that are go along with something that has a gray market. You may be importing your park, uh, products and they may have, uh, you know, black marketeers that bring your products in from some other source that are able to undercut your own uh, sales there. That's just something to consider. So they've been a member county country since 2005, but they haven't begun the negotiations as they're not. Uh, uh, progressing very well in their economic and political goals. So medium long term, maybe 10 years, uh, you know, maybe something they'll get on the ball and something will happen sooner, but not really seen as that happening. They do have formal trade agreements in place so you can use all their seat reports and declarations for proof of compliance. AEK is their uh, National Telecom Authority. They have a website and some things are in English, most things aren't. So uh, you know, use your Google Translate if you want to get some things there, but because it's using CD reports and, and uh, a great conformity, you shouldn't have too many issues with that. Serbia is one of the former uh, Yugoslav uh, countries that's really been progressing well economically. It's number 82. As far as GDP, PPP is, uh, they're heading towards EU membership. Uh, they've got an interim trade agreement and uh, they're... Uh, Country in 2012, the accession talk started in 2014, so they're well along the path. Uh, probably the uh, next, second next country we're expecting to join the European Union, depending on how things progress. So their National Telecom Authority is Retail, and they do have an English language website uh, that you can access there. So Turkey is the country expected to be the next EU member country. It's uh, 13th in the world for GDP, PPP. So this is definitely a market you'd want to be in. Uh, most likely a first tier country. Uh, has a mutual recognition agreement in place with the EU. And so it's going to accept all the CE reports and declarations of proof of compliance there. Some people consider this part of the Middle East, as you notice here on the area map I've got, the. Uh, from the CIA, they've got it grouped in with Arabian countries, but I really think it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a bridge between both European and the uh, Arab worlds, and it has been for uh, several millennia now. And uh, so uh, I think it's, you know, it's in there with the uh, uh, borders on Georgia and some of the other uh, uh, former countries there. And on the uh, east side, on the west side, it's bordering with uh, uh, Bulgaria and uh, part of Greece. So it's on track to join the EU. It started talks in 2005. Uh, it was expected to be the next EU member country, but there's been some, you know, some political unrest and things going on there with some uh, reversion back to uh, kind of authoritarian style, and it's created some economic upheaval in the country. So we're not sure. Uh, there isn't really a projected data when they may become a full member country. They've got a ways to go on their goals they have to meet. You know, the National Telecom Agency is ICTA, that's the English language version, and so you should be able to get some good information there. So 
So we're going to look at a couple other countries now. Uh, these we say informally, but uh, except the CE mark, because they don't have a uh, official trade agreement in place. So this does add a, a little bit of element to risk. That at some point they decided they wanted to set their own thing in. There would have to be. Uh, hopefully they get some, uh, you know, grandfathering and uh, some time for switchover. The thing to keep in mind though. So it's 113 for GDP PPP puts it about in the middle of the, of the countries as far as that goes. Maybe a future potential candidate country, but they haven't applied. And that top economic priorities acceleration of their integration into the EU. So they're going to uh, they accept those CE reports, declarations, proofs of market compliance uh, for entry into the country. Their uh, National Telecom Authority is Communications Regulatory Agency. Um, as you'll find in some of these smaller countries that may not have all the resources uh, that some of the uh, larger countries do. Uh, I was, as I mentioned, I do their website checks, and it's uh, not wasn't functioning as of yesterday. Uh, so sometimes these sites go down. Uh, all the documentation I have still indicates that's the right uh, website URL, but it may be a little while before they're back on time. You know, maybe they're uh, got some uh, uh, power outages and the rationing power in different parts of the country and non-essential. It's hard to say sometimes. They, you know. They don't like to talk about bad news when uh, things like that are going on, but that can also be another indication of the stability of the government and how good they are providing the uh, resources their citizens need. Kosovo, another a former Soviet, uh, I mean, a former Yugoslav Republic uh, member. So they're at 151, uh, about the bottom 25% of the list as far as GDP, PPP is. A uh, future potential candidate, but nothing's uh, officially started as far as applying for membership. But they have started working liberalization and trade with the EU. Uh, so they're accepting seat reports and declaration marks, but this is, I mentioned, informal. There's not a formal trade agreement in place for this. So that adds a little element of risk. National Telecom Authority, RAEPC, Regulatory Authority of Electronic and Postal Communications. And uh, they have, do have an English language website at this uh, cumbersome uh, URL that I've got written down here. All these are hyperlinks. You should be able to just click on it. You'll do control click uh, to get to those websites. So the EAC countries, this is the uh, Eurasian Economic Union Customs Union. We're going to talk about that uh, the most during this presentation today. They uh, have, have a, uh, set up a system similar to the European Union as a competitor of the European Union, but they haven't really gained a lot of members because there aren't really a lot of potential members for them. Uh, you know, this Russia and Kazakhstan are by far, uh, you know, two largest countries. Uh, uh, Russia is the, uh, you know, the big bear of the China shop there. Belarus has a, a lot of resources. Uh, Armenia and Kyrgyzstan are... Uh, Smaller countries, they were last to join. They haven't really got a lot to bring to the table, but they're there as part of that. So basically, you get uh, one approval and it's good for all five of these countries. And we'll talk about possible future members also in another couple of slides. So we got a little sub agenda here. So we're going to talk about the member countries and this custom union technical regulations. You may have seen the CUTR, sometimes it's written as TRCU. Uh, it's referring to this compliance scheme and uh, technical regulations are their standards. The Customs Union is this group of five countries. And then we'll talk about why they've got, uh, still have a separate telecom wireless approvals. So combined uh, GDP, PPP would rank them at the sixth largest economy, but that's, you know, it's just that would make uh, Russia the seventh largest at that point, because Russia already is the sixth largest. So EU is ranked at number two, China's at number one, U.S. number three, so uh, they're kind of far down the list from that. Combined population of uh, 178 would place them as eighth largest market country, and that compares to the 560 million or half a billion in the EU and the China and uh, India, both with well over a billion each. Those cover 15 percent of land, uh, Earth's land area, although a lot of that in the north is uh, tundra and not really useful to them. I apologize for that. Um, uh, you know, I live in Austin, Texas area, and we've got what we call cedar fever. The cedar trees have let all the pollen out, and for some reason, my body about 10 years ago decided I was allergic to it. This is always a fun time of year for me. 
So, this, as I mentioned, this tent is a competitor of the European Union. And it's, so far, it's made up of former Soviet Union states. It was uh, founded in uh, 2010, three member countries of Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russia. And economically, those are the three biggest members of this. Then Armenia and Kyrgyzstan joined in 2015. So they created this Eurasian Economic uh, Commission. Uh, so that's a governing body for the Eurasian Economic Union and the EU, EU Custom Union. And so it's a governing body of the EU Custom Union, which is a trade partnership. And similar to how the European Commission is the governing body of the European Union. So they do have a, a good English language uh, website, and it's at this URL here, Eurasian Commission. And uh, if you know, the EAC uh, comes from that Eurasian Commission, so it's EAC is the acronym for that. So uh, let's look at the big bear here first. So, so uh, GPPPP is sixth in the world. And populations is nice, and so internet users and uh, cell users are number six in the world, right in line with their position. So they've got a large economy, uh, a lot of consumers. Their GDP composition is uh, kind of similar to the U.S. They got service, sixty percent services, thirty in industry, and uh, about uh, a little bit less than five percent. And we're going to talk about this agriculture a bit today because that's one of the additional things. All these figures come from that World Factbook site. We can go and look at economy information and uh, energy. We'll give you about the you know oil and the other resources they have. So agriculture in a uh, you know state of the art uh, you know, country that's got modern farming techniques and equipment, you would usually be less than five percent. I think it's three point seven in U.S. and uh, Russia's got five point seven, which would uh, you know indicate this is a good place. Uh, crude oil production, they're number one in the world, so that's what, where they get a lot of their uh, money is petrodollars, so it does fluctuate depending on the price of oil as it's going on. They've got the eighth largest proven oil reserves in the world, uh, compared to now the U.S. has number one. It used to be in the Arab Peninsula, but uh, with the uh, recent shell deposits they've been working on. But they do have, uh, you know, number two in the world for natural gas uh, production, and they're uh, ranked at number one for the proven natural reserves. So they do have a lot of energy resources available to them to uh, bring them money and keep their economy drive, uh, driving. Armenia, however, you know, it's GPPPP is at 136 in the world. They do have a fair number of internet users and uh, mobile cell users in line with the population. We notice, as, as I mentioned, the agriculture, you notice here they've got 16.7%. Uh, so this indicates a very rural uh, farming community that's using a lot of outdated methods. And if they're doing that, uh, they're not being able to uh, allocate the workforce to things like services and industry of more technical nature. So this indicates a, a place that may not have, uh, you know, the uh, uh, extra dollars for consumer electronics and things like that. So it's another thing to take into consideration before you start selling your products in this country. Uh, Belarus has uh, got a lot of resources. Uh, GP, uh, PPP, uh, that's wrong there, uh, not seven from the world. But it, uh, the uh, internet users and cell phone users got a lot of uh, cell phone users. I think they're ranked 70, uh, 71st in the world. I'll check that, get it updated before we send out the presentation. So the GDP composition, you know, agriculture about 8.1, that's not bad, but it's higher than uh, uh, a, a lot of industrialized countries. So in case they still probably got some stuff going on with the uh, outdated, but the services is up to 50%. So we got some strong drivers for their economy. So next, uh, we're going to look at uh, Kazakhstan. And so their GDP PPP is ranked 42nd in the world. They've got a lot of natural resources, a lot of oil and stuff. And you notice their agriculture is around 4.7% in line with Russia. 
And then their service industry is a big part, almost two thirds of the economy, ag culture making up another third. You know, here are the internet users and mobile cellular at 41 and 48. That outpaces a population. So it tells you they've got a whole lot of, uh, you know, resources there as far as that. So if you're selling like smartphones, this is probably a good market for you. So uh, just another one of the indicators to look at. I do want to mention that we're going to be talking about the telecom agencies for the countries a little bit later uh, after some more on the uh, uh, compliance scheme for the uh, EAC. Now, Kyrgyzstan is 144th in the world as far as their uh, economic indicator of the GDP PPP. Uh, they do have about, you know, their uh, internet use is a lot of the population. They have a, a pretty good infrastructure with cell phones. And, but down here again on the ag culture, we see 14.6% of the label force is involved in that. So it's indicating they're using a, a lot of outdated methods for their farming and uh, not able to allocate those uh, work resources to more technical means. So may not have uh, quite the free uh, spending economy for a uh, uh, consumer electronics items. Then the future uh, EEU CU members, and this is according to the EEU, so I think they're a little bit biased. I think uh, they've got a list of nine countries. I think four are possible. The Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Turkmenistan, Georgia, and Moldova. Uh, as you notice from the you know, population right here, uh, Uzbekistan is only one of any size, and uh, uh, but the GDP here is 64th compared to the population of 44th in the case of poorer country, and, uh, and none of them are uh, showing indication of being really uh, heavily invested in tech. So it's possible. Now, these countries we'll talk about uh, uh, later in the presentation that uh, aren't affiliated with them. And uh, then they have others. Uh, Azerbaijan is not likely to join. Uh, they've had some uh, having some uh, political difficulties with Russia, so their kind of uh, population is biased against it. Uh, they voted against joining. Ukraine, you're probably aware of the political situation there, where Russia's annexed part of their territory. Uh, there's no way they're willingly going to join that. And that's uh, the Estonia. Latvia and Lithuania are already EU member countries. So that was my acronym, NGH, not going to happen. They're not going to willingly leave the European Union to uh, join a lesser organization that doesn't give them the free trading they already enjoy. I just never say never, but I don't see that happening. So let's look a little bit more in depth on the Customs Union technical regulations and compliance scheme. So this all started with the three countries, uh, uh, Russia and uh, Kazakhstan and Belarus. Around uh, 2010, they first started talking. Then the next year, they had a, a joint commission uh, to make for a former to uh, to get them uh, closer economic ties, and they uh, wanted to have the, the system in place by 2015. And uh, so uh, they've. Uh, 2012, they initially, um, uh, you know, launched this program, joined by Armenia and Kyrgyzstan in 2015. And so they've got the EAC product marking scheme, like the CE marking. It's an acronym, which I mentioned earlier, for Eurasian uh, Conformity. And it signifies the markings undergone the uh, requirement uh, testing and uh, conformity assessment procedures. It's met all the uh, technical requirements. So CETU, our certification for uh, Customs Union, you got to comply with all their technical regulations, which is their standards. And uh, for electronics, that's the EMC and product safety. If you notice, we're not talking about wireless to telecom. That's going to come later. We'll talk about what's going on with the development sale. And then... Uh, so they can be documented by either a certificate of conformity or declaration of conformity. And it's got to be done by somebody who's a member country of uh, the uh, EAC scheme, the Customs Union Technical Regulation Scheme. And these are required for them to cross borders. So it has to meet the requirements if it is a uh, uh, on the mandated list for products. And you can get that from uh, that website I mentioned earlier for the EEU. 
either they're going to focus on the goods produced, so that's going to be a product certificate, or by the uh, factories on how the product is made and how they can uh, ensure that it's going to keep uh, getting the same, uh, uh, made the same way with the same components over a period of time. So if it meets the certification requirements, we receives that uh, approval, either COC or DOC, then it's going to be able to be imported and be able to sold in those five countries. And uh, if anything's not certified, it's going to be seized and stopped at the border. So this replaced their GOST approval system for Russia, if you remember earlier, which is no longer in effect except for a couple of categories, but it only grants you uh, approvals for Russia. So uh, I, I don't know that any companies are doing uh, that route anymore. So CUTR uh, product categories, there's more being added all the time, but most uh, you know, typ typical ones for our customers are ITE, audio video equipment, household appliances, uh, you know, wire, some wired central office telecom equipment, scientific implementation, test equipment, and medical equipment. And uh, so this, you know, as we mentioned, they're gonna have two types of conformity assessment procedures, either COC or DOC. And uh, this is a special note I wanna uh, make sure you see here at the bottom. For a DOC, the applicant must be a local entity registered at the territory of a member country. This means you've gotta have a business presence in one of those five countries to apply for a DOC. You can't do it externally. If you're a U.S. company with no presence there, you're gonna to have to go to the CLC route or Certificate of Conformity. So all that testing, inspection, certification can only be performed by a local, which means in an EEU country, certification body on indoor testing laboratory. So it's gotta be uh, you know, one of those member states that's got the test labs. There are exceptions uh, where EU member companies member recognize international organization. The most common example is uh, if it's a member of the uh, IECEE CB scheme for product safety, then they'll accept those reports that have the country deviations for those five countries of the EU. Once you pass everything and uh, got your certificates, uh, they have to be officially registered in each of the five EU countries official registry. Uh, and the length of, uh, you know, how the validity is how long is the cert good for. It's from one to five years, depending on the category of equipment and the manufacturer has input to. And series manufacturing certificates have a manual ambulatory surveillance action of either sample test or factory inspection. So they do do market uh, surveillance. Okay, next we're gonna look at some common standards. So these are the TRs, the technical regulations, the customs union technical regulations, you can just look at as the AC standard. So here's some of the common ones. The EMC and product safety and uh, packaging and safety machinery, that's industrial equipment. Uh, there's a ton of them out there now, depending on what your particular uh, product is like medical or you know uh, shipboard maritime equipment is uh, just like with the gas certificates under the previous approval scheme for Russia you got to include these certificates with your shipments if you don't you're going to lay it they're going to have it customs they're going to ask for a certificate you got to scramble and get one sent to whatever the customs office is at so it's better just to include copies of those in there with the products these uh, two I've got down here are examples of a, a COC, the more formal looking one on the left, and the DLCs on the right. Now, factory inspection reports, all products are going to have to have their factory inspected where they're made. So any factory that's making a product that's getting the EAC mark and intended for shipment to one of these countries is going to have to have factory inspection. It has to be by CUTR authorized factory inspector, not just any ISO 9000 or whatever your quality management system is, uh, is not going to suffice. It's got to be a CUTR authorized factory inspector. Uh, it kind of hangs up some companies that go scramble and hire and, and you know, get one flown over. There are uh, uh, factory inspectors uh, in the U.S. now 
so you don't have all the expense of flying somebody from Russia. But uh, you need to be planning, working on that as you're starting your submittal process because it would take several months. Next, we'll talk about the hygienic sanitary certificate. Um, and so these are things that have to do with uh, human health and safety. So uh, uh, you've got three different kinds. Some are required, uh, others are uh, subject to sanitary control in the form of state regulation, meaning you know from country to country may be slightly different, and control-free products are exempt from regulations. So here's some examples, machinery, appliances. So the first category here is the require uh, audio, video, broadcasting, anything with a transmitter in it is going to, or screen, or just transmitting data of any kind is going to have to uh, receive a certificate. And uh, the most uh, common example I'm thinking of is like, uh, you know, for SAR, uh, specific absorption duration testing, like they have to do on cell phones or a Bluetooth headset. It's a product submitting ionized radiation. That's what they're talking about. Materials will be in direct contact with human skin. So uh, other things down here, uh, you know, they're talking about chemicals, petrochemicals, and especially anything uh, used by children. Toys, you know, if a computer can be used by a child, it's on that list of... Uh, and then they have control-free products with exempt from regulation is the third category. So, um, summing this up, so they have all these agreements in place for product safety and uh, EMC and other categories, but if you'll notice today, uh, so far we haven't, for the EAC uh, compliance scheme, we haven't talked about uh, wireless or telecom. So this is one of the areas where they have not harmonized for each one because it could take a long time to do it and as you expect the spectrum uh, getting five countries agree on how the spectrum is going to be utilized in a common way it may not be easiest to do so some are doing their own thing example of this is belarus with their uh, energy efficiency standards they put out uh, a couple of years uh, well i guess it was last year so now we're going to talk about the telecom wireless agencies in the EOC countries so even though They've had this thing in development since uh, you know, 2010. Uh, they still haven't worked it out for telecom and wireless. Uh, the uh, estimate, and this isn't from anything the EAUs put out, but industry, you know, this uh, gossip, I guess you could call it, is 2020. And I think that may be wishful thinking. Don't hold your breath. So until it gets it put in place, you've got to get five separate uh, approvals for any product that has a telecom or wireless feature in it. Anything with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, any kind of RF transmitted data, uh, whether it's audio or uh, computer data, any anything has got to uh, receive an approval this time. If you have a, a, a telephone port, you know, a fax machine, anything connects to the central, uh, you know, telephone uh, equipment and the uh, infrastructure it has to meet that. So. That's why I'm kind of emphasizing and repeat myself here, but you've got to get a, each approval for each individual country. Just because you have your uh, EHC certificate for uh, EMC and, and product safety, it's still going to be stopped if you don't have that individual country's uh, wireless or telecom certificate to go along with it. So starting with Russia, they have the... Uh, English language website given here, and that's the Ministry of Telecom and Mass Communication. And uh, we've got a pretty informative website. Also, depending on product, there may be uh, additional uh, approval required for uh, if it has military applications, but that's outside the scope of what we're looking at right now. So, this Savaz certificate, in which I'm pretty sure I'm not pronouncing it all correctly, uh, I don't speak any Russian at all, except uh, not, uh, was it? Uh, Da and yet, but uh, so they it's based on Article 16 of the, the federal law on communications. This has to do with uh, any telecom equipment. So the process is you got to apply to Gus Common Savai uh, Department Technical Review, and if it passes that review, it goes to actual equipment test. So the technical review is all the documentation reviews, schematics, the 
uh, block diagrams, uh, uh, the theory of operation, uh, photos of inside. And uh, once it passes all that, then it'll get a cert that's good for three years. If you continue to sell your product after three years, you got to get it renewed. There's also this additional permit uh, from the uh, GKRCH uh, to use the radio spectrum and specific, on a specific frequency band in a specific area of Russia. So everywhere you got to have it, if you're going to be all over the Russian territories, you got to have one for each uh, territory. Uh, included on the certificate. So it's not just one certificate in Russia, it's uh, both of these have got to be there. And uh, also, they've got the certificate compliance uh, after safety testing. And uh, a certificate that this is, uh, has to do with uh, uh, marine equipment that uh, Russian Marine Register. Uh, to make sure you're not going to interfere with any shipboard communications. So typical path, you know, this depends on whether it's completely wireless. You go one path through uh, telecom or the federal agent communications and you get your DOC and register. If it's uh, telecom, you got the right path there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the left was uh, no radio. That's uh, for your telecom. Uh, right when radio on, if you got both, then you're going to go through both paths to get uh, uh, both uh, uh, doc, uh, both certificates, radio permit and the DOC or certification. So for any telecom product, that uh, certification uh, CUTR for EMC and product safety is mandatory along with that. And depending on the application, hygienic certificate. So if you got something that's uh, you know, you know, portable or mobile, going to be close proximity to the human body, you're going to have to get that. Also, uh, the the VAT, yeah, has a certificate for radio. They also, have your RF importation permit. And so, this is why we recommend uh, for us you definitely have a knowledgeable consultant that knows all the certificates and uh, different things you're going to have to have. get through customs and get your products onto the market. Then, for our media, we've got the PSRC. They do have an English language website that's the Public Services Regulatory Commission. And so you'll get there, that URL for more information. Belarus has the Ministry of Communication Information. So they changed their name recently from the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications. We can go to their website, still MPT, so they just get the same URL, just change their name. Kazakhstan has the Ministry of Investment and Development, and the English language ver uh, version there at that URL. Remember, you're going to have to go to all five of these countries. Here's the one for Kyrgyzstan, Ministry of Transport Communication. So in addition to your uh, CUTR certificates for EMC and product safety, you're going to have to have individual country certificate for wireless and telecom. So here at the end, we're going to talk about a few that have their own independent regulatory schemes, not really linked to any other uh, European country. Azerbaijan. And a lot of oil, but their so, economy is so heavily dependent on oil and gas. 90% of their exports are oil and gas. Uh, they don't have a whole lot. You can see the 78th largest exporting country. So, but you notice here in agriculture, 37%, that's a very high percentage. That means they've got a lot of, uh, you know, guys out there plowing fields with oxen and doing stuff by hand where we're uh, more industrialized countries. They've got machines doing it and they're able to be more efficient. So they've got about close to 50% for services, but industry is very small. So agriculture is, is uh, you know, the second largest grouping of workers there. So they only require telecom and wireless approvals. They don't have a product safety or EMC in place. So it's the Ministry of Communication and High Technologies, and it's linked to the website. It's not in English, even though they do have a, a logo in English, but uh, you go to the website, you're going to find the Azerbaijan language all throughout it. So uh, Google Translate does a moderate job on it, but don't know what rely on it for official uh, translations. Georgia, uh, the one not in the American South, is uh, borders Russia and Turkey. 
and uh, several other uh, uh, countries. Azure Design uh, is also one of its neighbors. Uh, rank 118 says, joining the EU and NATO are among the country's top foreign policy goals, but they're a ways away from doing either one. Services, about two-thirds of the economy, industry 24%, agriculture around 8%, so they've got a pretty good mix of uh, where the workers are at. So Georgia is a bit of a uh, wild on the west kind of a thing as far as regulatory goes, so they used to accept the gas approvals and reports. However, uh, as we noted, uh, you know, uh, the uh, CUTR EAC marking scheme took over in 2015, and uh, they haven't really said what they're going to do officially. So, uh, incidental reports from what I've been hearing for other regulators are that uh, they're accepting the TUCU uh, certificates, but it's not, it's not a formal agreement on the books or anything, so that's something that could change. They do uh, have a uh, National Tele Telecom Authority and National Communications uh, Commission with an English language website uh, where you can find more information. So there's some risk there from what actually the certification requirements are. Uh, Moldova, sandwiched between Ukraine and Romania, uh, 143rd, so they're about bottom 25% of economies. They want to complete a free trade agreement with the EU. They're working on it, but it's not there yet. Most ag culture is about a third of their economy or a third of the workforce. And so that in case they may not have the uh, brief spending for consumer items that uh, some other countries do in the region, it's something to look at. Great place if you're making electronics for tractors, not so good for consumer electronics. The National Regular uh, Regulatory Agency, or NRA, uh, is has an English language website, and uh, they do require in-country testing and uh, no product marking required. In Turkmenistan, we mentioned that's uh, a, a potential member of the EAC marking scheme, the uh, EEC countries. Uh, they've got uh, a lot of uh, petroleum products, uh, so uh, that's uh, their economy is heavily dependent on the gas and the oil in their country. Their National Telecom Authority is Ministry of Communications. At tremendous stands. Uh, if you've been watching the series for a while, you notice there's a lot of NOCs. Israel has NOC. It's a real popular name for regulatory agencies. They used to accept the GOST approvals, so uh, just like we were talking about in Georgia, uh, we think, uh, you know, from what we've been hearing, the TU, TRCU products, uh, those reports and uh, docs are being accepted for importation to sell in those countries, but there's not a formal agreement in place, so there's a little bit of risk there associated with that. Ukraine is uh, Rank 50 on the GDP PPP, that's gone down in the past few years because of the uh, conflict going on there with Russia, where Russia uh, seized uh, part of their territory, and uh, there's uh, intermittent fighting going along in those disputed areas. Uh, they're 48th largest exporter, they have a lot of resources, and uh, mobile cellular user 27th and internet user 30. You can see they're heavily invested in the high tech and uh, IT equipment and infrastructure associated with that. Uh, we've got a lot of good knowledge workers there. It's a good marketplace. It's just uh, uncertainty there. It comes from the conflict going on uh, within their borders uh, with Russia. So Euchre test is uh, an agency that assesses the uh, certification and, and testing of electrical equipment. And uh, so they cover EMC, product safety, wireless telecom, energy efficiency. Have a really good English language website and the URL I provide here. You can get a lot more information on them. It's the Ukrainian State Center of Radio Frequencies is similar to our FCC, where they've got the uh, you know the spectrum management functions and uh, the, the requirements for uh, anything that transmits data. Uh, wirelessly. And the last country we're going to look at today is Uzbekistan. I think that uh, country came up during our 2016 presidential election at some point, but uh, GPPPP is ranked 63rd. They've got a lot of uh, energy resources, uh, you know, oil, 
uh, uh, minerals, uh, textiles, and all that stuff. You notice the agriculture is 17.9, so you know 18% of the workforce is involved in agriculture. Not so much left over for other you know high tech industries and services. So uh, just like the you know there's a good good market for electronics for uh, farming, maybe not so much for consumer. Their uh, National Telecom Authority is Ministry for Development of Information Technologies and Communication of the Republic of Uzbekistan. They have an English language website. I think most of the stuff I saw was in English. Uh, may not have everything there, but that's a uh, another URL you can check. So the mission today, I checked out all uh, the, uh, the websites for all 24 agencies for these 24 countries. And uh, they were all working except for the uh, one exception I noted. So conclusion recommendations, be flexible and research your markets. So there's all kinds of different levels of uh, consumer bases in these countries. Make sure uh, your products make sense. If you're a consumer product, make sure you're going into countries that can be able to support that uh, uh, market base there for your, whatever it is you're selling. Uh, consider a multi-phase or uh, three-phase uh, approach. Uh, even when I was working at one of the largest uh, ITE companies, we'd still do the same thing. We'd start out with FCC and ITE, I mean, in uh, European Union approvals, because so many countries love to drop those reports, and so we could phase products out. And uh, you get the economies of, you know, starting to sell and, uh, you know, the larger markets to support the uh, efforts to get to the smaller ones. You know, after you got your CD approvals and you're able to start in most countries except about right. Next, you can go to ones that just accept the reports as proof of compliance, but you still have to make a submittal for, and then consider the others that don't accept CE or FCC reports to go into. Make sure you're checking to make sure those are countries that make sense for your products. Check the official EC agency website often. That's uh, for specific to you know Russia and the other four countries that union, but things do change all the time there. So there may be you know the one thing I'm looking for is when the telecom and wireless uh, approvals uh, get uh, unified, so they're all using uh, just one approval for that. We won't have to go to the five separate countries anymore. Industry affinity groups are a good a way to talk about, you know, who's had problems or who's had issues or who found a good agent in which country. So it's good to find reliable, knowledgeable partners, especially in these uh, countries that are smaller and uh, maybe a little less stable than others. Make sure that you're uh, getting in there and getting to the right people so your products can get to market without any undue hindrances. Here's some online resources, in addition to ones I gave throughout there, some of these are repeats. So there's the European Free Trade Association for those four countries, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Sweden. The Region Economic Commission for the Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Russia. Uh, the main site there is not available in English. They do have a limited site uh, in English. And finally, I'm giving the uh, official European Union uh, English language website as a source because they also provide information uh, like our Department of Commerce does on if you want to trade in other countries outside the European Union, what are the requirements? And so they cover these other non-EU member countries in Europe. And so there's a lot of resources. And in fact, that's the most resources you're probably going to find uh, on any regulatory website. Uh, and easier to find, uh, not a whole lot easier, but easier to find stuff than the FCC website. So I'm going to look at questions now. And see what we've got here. I don't see anything on Q&A. don't see anything on chat. So either I put you all to sleep or you uh, overwhelmed you. So uh, if you have questions, be sure to contact me if you think of something later or on our other topics. As I mentioned, uh, we didn't talk about the European Union today, but uh, I give presentations on it every year. So if you want some more on that, just contact me at this email and I'll send you the last presentation I gave earlier this year on the European Union. And uh, 
or any other topic, you can look back at our calendars and see what else we saw. I think the next uh, European Union update I'm giving is uh, June or July uh, next year. And we've already got a calendar out there uh, for upcoming webinars. I do want to uh, mention the IEEE uh, EMC uh, plus HIPI uh, symposium is going to be in July in New Orleans. And we'd like to welcome you there. That's the Electromagnetic Compatibility Society in uh, conjunction with the Signal Integrity and Power Integrity Group. A lot of good information, a lot of presentations. The presentations and the, paper, and the technical papers are the main events at this uh, symposiums. Uh, go to that website and check it out. If you want some just more general information, I always work for the symposium committee. So uh, I hopefully can help you out if you're thinking about having an exhibit booth there or just one to ten for the first time. Uh, next upcoming International Approval Series, we do these once a month for free. Anybody wants to sign up for them. Uh, in January, we're going to have one on the 25 largest market countries in Africa. In February, for Valentine's Day, we're having Australia and New Zealand compliance. And then on March 14th, uh, BRIC compliance, a popular topic on Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and the requirements to get in those uh, uh, really growing marketplaces. And the bottom is the link where you can see all the courses. So thank you for attending today. Uh, please contact me if you think of something else you want to talk about, or if you have a project you're uh, wanting to start for international approvals, or you know, U.S. or European Union, uh, we'd be glad to help you. Take care, and we'll see you next month.